There's a pretty cool video that's been floating around for a while called the explosive polymerization of P-nitroaniline. A small amount of P-nitroaniline is mixed with sulfuric acid and heated over a Bunsen burner. Then, after a short period of time, a large snake suddenly appears. I've actually already tried doing this in the past, and it was one of the first videos that I ever made. However, my results were a little less impressive. It was honestly really quite sad in comparison, and because of this, I've decided to try it out again. I'm going to be remaking the P-nitroaniline, but this time, I'm going to set up the demo a little differently and see if I get some better results. On a side note, not all of the P-nitroaniline that I make here is going to be used in this video. I'm going to be saving some to make a dye called Para Red, which can be used to dye cotton and other cellulose-based fabrics. So to make the P-nitroaniline, this is everything that I'm going to need. The hydrochloric acid, the acetic acid, and sodium hydroxide were purchased from the store, but the sulfuric acid, the nitric acid, and the acetanilide were all made in previous videos. If you're interested in seeing how I did this, I've put some links in the description. So to start things off, I dump the acetanilide into a beaker, and I pour in some acetic acid. Then, on top of this, I drop in a magnetic stir bar. A small amount of the acetanilide dissolves, but most of it doesn't, so I'm going to have to heat things up a little. I put everything into some hot water, I turn on the magnetic stirring, and I just wait. I had to replenish the hot water a couple times, but after 5 or 10 minutes, everything dissolves. I take away the hot water, and I slowly add some ice-cold sulfuric acid. It's important to use cold sulfuric acid and to add it slowly here, because its addition generates a lot of heat. Anyway, when I'm done adding the acid, I set up an ice bath and I wait for it to cool to between 0 and 5 degrees Celsius. This is going to take a little bit of time though, so while I'm waiting, I prepare my nitration solution. To another beaker in an ice bath, I add some nitric acid and I wait for it to cool. When it gets to around 0 C, I start to add ice-cold sulfuric acid. Just like before, adding the sulfuric acid produces a lot of heat, so it's really important to do this slowly. I was a little bit impatient, so it heated up more than it should have, and you can see acid vapors coming off. If this happens, it isn't a big problem, but you really don't want to breathe this in. Anyway, I cover the top with a watch glass, and then I just wait for things to cool. It eventually cools down to around 0 C, so I'm ready to get the reaction going. All of the nitration mixture needs to be added to this solution, but it has to be done slowly and with strong stirring. Ideally, I would have just used magnetic stirring, but as the solution cooled, it thickened up and it's having a hard time. Anything that I add will just sit at the top, so I also need to manually mix things. On a side note, what's kind of interesting is the refractive index of my solution here is very close to that of the stir rod. So because of this, it kind of disappears and it made mixing things a little bit weird. Anyway, this part is pretty slow because I need to add about 100 milliliters, but only a few drops at a time. As it's added, the temperature rises, and it's really important to never let it go above 20 C. What was kind of tricky was that the temperature increase wasn't always immediate, so I needed to be really patient and to make sure that the temperature was decreasing before adding more. Adding it too quickly could cause a temperature spike, which would lead to side products that we really don't want. Anyway, the reaction I'm doing here is a pretty simple nitration. In the presence of the nitric and sulfuric acid mixture, the acetanilide is nitrated to form both ortho and para nitroacetanilide. The para isomer is the one I want, and the ortho one is just an unavoidable side product. So for this reaction, the major reason why we're keeping it at a lower temperature is to prevent multiple nitrations. Below 20C, we mostly just get the mononitration, but if I were to do the reaction at, let's say, around 50C, I would get a lot of dye and probably tri-nitrated products. 
Anyway, I'm eventually done adding everything, so I take it out of the ice bath and I let it sit for about 30 minutes. As it sits here, it slowly warms up to room temperature and the reaction goes to completion. It's important to not let it sit here too long though, otherwise it might start to get dye and trinitrated. So about a half hour later, I take it off the stir plate and I dump it into some ice water. It's important that the water here is freezing cold and packed with ice because the addition of the acid is going to heat things up quite a bit. The products that I made in the reaction, both the ortho and the paranitroacetanilide, are not very soluble in water, so they quickly precipitate out. I go ahead and dump the rest in, and I give the beaker a good washing to make sure that I transfer everything. I stir it around a bit to mix it as well as possible, and then I move on to filtering. I'm not exactly sure why, but by the time I went to go and add it, it had become quite yellow. This really isn't an issue though. Anyway, even after pulling away most of the liquid, the stuff that I have here is still full of acid, so I need to wash it a few times with some ice cold water. After the washings, I keep the vacuum on for a couple minutes to just try to dry it up as much as possible. I transfer everything to a large beaker, and then I dump in some dilute hydrochloric acid. I mix things around to try to break up any large chunks, and I turn on the hot plate. On top of the beaker, I place a round bottom flask that's filled with ice, which should recondense any vapors that come off. The stir bar from the first part of the reaction was never separated from the p-nitroacetanilide, so it was transferred over and it's still in this beaker. So I turned on the stirring, hoping that it would be enough to mix things, but it really wasn't. What I ended up needing to do was just occasionally taking off the round bottom flask, mixing things around with a glass rod, and then putting the flask back on. Eventually, it got to a point where it liquefied enough that the stir bar is able to work. So what I'm doing here is a hydrolysis reaction where the p-nitroacetanilide is being converted to p-nitroaniline with acetic acid as a side product. The p-nitroaniline that forms has a free amine group in it, which is basic, so it reacts with the hydrochloric acid. This produces a salt compound, simply called p-nitroaniline hydrochloride, which is soluble in water. So as the reaction progresses, more and more of our product should dissolve into solution until it's eventually all gone. Anyway, eventually everything disappears. I continue heating things at just below the boiling point for about 15 minutes to just really make sure that the reaction is done. 15 minutes later it looked pretty good, but there were still some solid things floating around and I'll need to get rid of them. To do this it's really simple and I just need to do another quick filtration. On top of this I also pass through a whole bunch of water to dilute the solution that we have here. This dilution step is necessary for the procedure, but it's also useful to wash out the beaker as well as the filter. Then I prepare a mixture of ice and water, and I dump everything in. I give everything a good mix, and then I check the pH, and as expected, it's really acidic. As I mentioned before, what we have in these acidic conditions is p-nitroaniline hydrochloride, but we want the free base version. So to free it up, I need to neutralize all the acid and make this mixture basic. I whip up a really strong solution of sodium hydroxide, and I just keep dumping it in and checking the pH. Eventually, all the acid is gone and the solution is pretty strongly basic, so at this point I'm done. After adding all the sodium hydroxide though, this mixture is pretty hot, so before I filter things off, I need to cool it down. The p-nitroaniline is somewhat soluble in hot water, so by cooling it down, we're precipitating as much as possible. It's also possible to cool it using a fridge or a freezer, but I was pretty impatient, so I just dumped ice in it. Once it was nice and cold, I filtered everything off. I washed it a few times with cold water, and then I left the vacuum on to try to dry it up. Unfortunately, I'm not quite done yet, 
and I still need to separate my paranitroaniline from the ortho side product. To do this, I'll need to do a recrystallization. I dissolve everything in a minimal amount of boiling hot ethanol, and then I let it slowly cool. When it does, the less soluble paranitroaniline will crystallize out, but the orthonitroaniline, which is more soluble, should stay dissolved. Once it got down to around room temperature, I placed it in the freezer to make sure it crystallized as much as possible. All the crystals were filtered off, washed with some ice cold ethanol, and then allowed to dry. So this is the final product after drying for a day or so. My camera is a little bit weird with its yellows, oranges, and reds, so it looks a lot more orange here than it actually is. In any case though, it's time to test it out. I kept about 5 grams of it to make my para red, but the rest of it is going to be used for the demo. The basic idea is to mix concentrated sulfuric acid with the p-nitroaniline and to heat it up. The major problem from the beginning though was I didn't know exactly how much of each ingredient to use, so I kind of had to experiment a little. Also, I don't have a wire gauze to even out the heating, so I'm going to have to be a lot more careful with the flame. So for my first run, I add a few grams of p-nitroaniline to a measuring spoon, and then I turn on the Bunsen burner. On top of this, I quickly pour in 2 milliliters of sulfuric acid, and I give things a good mix. Now, I just wait for the p-nitroaniline to melt, and react with the sulfuric acid. The exact details of this reaction aren't really known, but I did find a resource online that explains most of it. The first phase of the reaction is the pre-expansion stage, which occurs below about 230C. During this time, the sulfuric acid attacks the p-nitroaniline and does two major reactions, dehydration and sulfonation. We also get some deamination going on, and it starts to polymerize, forming this black tar. The second phase of this reaction occurs above 230C. During this stage, sulfur dioxide gas and water vapors are produced extremely quickly, which causes things to erupt and puff up. The final snake that forms is a really complicated polymer network mixed in with carbon. Anyway, the effect that I got from this run was not at all what I expected, but it was still pretty cool. It turned out like this because my measuring spoon wasn't big enough, so things kind of spilled out before the major part of the reaction took place. This is something cool that I noticed only now that I'm editing things. If I slow it down and go frame by frame, you can see that the liquid that spills over the side actually freezes and puffs up in mid-air. The stuff that I'm left with is not very strong, and it has a soft, sponge-like texture. It's also really light because it's mostly just gases. Anyway, I tried to do it again in the measuring spoon, but it all spilled out, so clearly I have to use something bigger. I tried it in one of my Nile Red 50ml beakers, and it almost worked, but it tipped over. So at this point, it wasn't working super well, and I wanted to see what would happen if I used less sulfuric acid. The first thing to notice is that as it's heated up, a lot of yellow smoke comes off, which is just vaporized p-nitroaniline. This time, it was a lot more violent, and it launched a bunch of it into the air. There was still some left in the beaker though, and to me, it looked like a really dead and miserable cactus. The snake that's produced here is also a lot more brittle and fragile. I went ahead and ran it again, but this time I used less heat. This slowed down the reaction a lot, and it was barely able to make it out of the beaker. I decided to try it again using less heat except with the measuring spoon to see if it would make a difference. However, pretty much as expected, because the heating was so low, I really didn't get a very violent reaction. Also, I think because I was using less sulfuric acid, there was a lot of unreacted p-nitroaniline left over, which was able to catch on fire. Okay, so using less sulfuric acid seems to be generally a bad idea, so I decided to try it in the other direction and use a little bit more. Unfortunately, this was the last bit of p-nitroaniline that I had, so I was really hoping it would work out. 
The effect that I got here was pretty cool, but it still wasn't what I was looking for, so I was honestly a little bit sad. From a bunch of the runs, I saved the snakes to show you guys what the textures were like. As I mentioned before, when I used less sulfuric acid, the stuff I produced was really brittle, which is what you see here. I had to be very careful, and if I squeezed too hard when I picked it up, it just crumbled. This stuff is when I used more sulfuric acid, and it has a much more spongy texture. It feels so much stronger when I hold it, and I'm not worried about it just crumbling between my fingers. This is the snake from the first run that I did, and because I did it in an open container, the texture is really different. Anyway, because it's pretty much just gases, it's kind of like styrofoam, there's not actually much solid material there. With very little force, I can easily squish it into a pancake. One cool thing about this is that whatever polymer this is, it's quite resistant to fire. Also, because most of its volume is gas, it's a good insulator and blocks the heat pretty well. At some point, NASA studied this material as a potential insulator for spacecraft, but it never ended up being used. I was honestly impressed that I was able to blast it with a blowtorch for such a long time without damaging the paper underneath. Also, I can blast it for several seconds until it's red hot, and then pretty much immediately touch it, and it's not that much hotter than room temperature. Anyway, I guess that's about it. In general, I was pretty happy with how this project turned out, but I was still a little bit sad that I wasn't able to recreate that effect. It kind of just seems like a crapshoot, because even under the same conditions, the reaction never seems to turn out the same way. On top of this, there's a lot of variables to control, like the amount of sulfuric acid to use, the amount of heating, or the container to do it in. What I've decided is that I'm committed to absolutely recreating this effect, so I'm going to buy a whole bunch of P-nitroaniline, and I'm just going to keep doing runs until I get it to work. I'll try it a whole bunch of different ways, using different amounts of sulfuric acid, different heating techniques, and various containers. I'm also thinking of making a whole event out of it, and maybe live streaming it. I have no idea of when exactly I would do this though, but I'll make sure to tell all of you guys so you won't miss it. A big thanks goes out to all of my supporters on Patreon. Everyone who supports me will see my videos 24 hours before I post it to YouTube, and they can also directly message me. Anyone who supports me with $5 or more will also get their name at the end like you see here.